I too have a slight cold. <laughs> I warn you. <clears throat> I don't know if there's a cough button on this thing, but um, I'll, uh, I'll try to find it. Um, thank you to Larry Arm and to Tim Casper, to Doug Jeffrey and Matt Bell and Mary Jo Ewigan, Ewigan. Um, and also Kim Ellsworth, who helped me negotiate my departure from snowy Boston yesterday. <clears throat> 95 inches of snow and counting. Um, but of course, I'm a New Englander. I just think it's great. <clears throat> um, but this is not just a cold and wintry season in, in, in America. It's also an election season coming up. I sort of get that feeling from some of the speakers. Um, so I'd like to start with that. Um, if you ask yourself, what is the most important thing about the upcoming American election? I'm sure everyone here will have their answers, and many other Americans will have other answers. Um, but the answer <clears throat> is different outside this country. 95% of the people in the world are not Americans. And to those people, for billions of them, billions of them. The most important thing about the American election is that the winning party is not going to round up the losing party and put them in jail, however much they might want to. I gave a talk in China um, before the last presidential election at a uh, Chinese university. I think it was Fudan University in Shanghai. And one of the students asked, who is going to be the next American president? And I said that I didn't know. And I could tell from their faces, or at least I thought I could, um, and from some comments I got afterward, that they just figured I wasn't a very important person. Because if I was an important person, I would know who was going to be the next president. Um, so I picked up on that and I said, you know, nobody knows. Well, they were incredulous. I felt obliged to explain that a little bit, <clears throat> that it actually was a contest um, and that the winning party was not going to put the losing party in jail. And I could see the smile on the face of my host, who was a very experienced and a very wise foreign service officer, <clears throat> who was very happy to see this slipped into a lecture that was actually supposed to be about something else. But this message is not really getting out there these days, these kinds of messages. Um, when 95% of humanity, well, make that 90%, because I think there's probably another five who do know America pretty well and do understand these things, maybe, maybe even 10%. Um, but let's say 85 to 80 to 90% of the people in the world when they look at America and its elections and other things, what do they see? Well, I'll give you a little taste of what a lot of them see. And this is true everywhere in the world, including Europe. In early 2001, the State Department did one of its rare follow-up studies of international visitors. They have a fairly robust international visitors program, but they rarely do follow-up studies is sort of odd, but that's the way people do evaluation in Washington these days. <clears throat> they commissioned a follow-up study of 60 Mexicans who had been brought here on an international visitors program uh, in late 2000, early 2001. And here is part of the report's summary of what the visitors had to say about the difference between the Americans that they met when they were here and the Americans that they saw uh, on their television screens and their movie screens. I quote, people who watch US television shows, attend Hollywood movies, and listen to pop music can't help but believe that we are a nation in which we have sex with strangers regularly, we wander the streets well armed and fully prepared to shoot our neighbors at the slightest provocation, and the lifestyle to which we aspire is one of rich cocaine snorting sybarites. And this was before the release of Wolf of Wall Street. 
The report continues. This is not an accurate depiction of the United States, nor is it attractive to many people around the world. The Mexican visitors were very clear that their images of America shaped by commercial entertainment media were inaccurate and distorted and gave them a negative perception of the United States. And this was from one of our closest neighbors before 9-11. So here's, when they asked me to set up an election debate, <clears throat> which they're not going to do, <laughs> um, this is what I'd like to, this is a question I would like to see debated in the upcoming election. And this is a more general question, but it relates to the rest of my talk. I'd like to see the Democrats speak about what they think government cannot and should not do. Now, I'm sure you all would like to hear that too. <clears throat> but I would also like to ask the Republican candidates what they think government can and should do. And it would be very interesting to hear if people actually have to answer those questions. Now, the starting point of my book, Through a Screen Darkly, and yes, it's an allusion to Paul, um, is that when the Cold War ended, the United States government got out of the business of representing the United States to the rest of the world. And they allowed the job by default, by semi-conscious decision to be taken over by the entertainment industry. Now this was a, de a decision that was made gradually over the 90s, um, culminating in the termination of the USIA in 1999. That would be the US Information Agency, which was a semi-autonomous agency that used to handle what is called public diplomacy around the world. Um, it was bipartisan. It was made with very little debate. Um, but as one conservative veteran of the USIA put it to me, he said, that was a piece of bipartisan bad judgment. So my talk today will have three parts. The first is to look at the current, look at the current crisis in US public diplomacy and to um, say a little bit about how it developed over time and, and why it happened the way it did, briefly, very briefly. And second, to talk about the role of exported popular culture, our Hollywood films, our TV shows, our popular music, in deepening the crisis. The crisis being a crisis of uh, America's reputation. And third, uh, to talk about what it would be required uh, as a solution, or what would be required as part of a solution. <clears throat> so to talk about the first uh, part, um, the, I'll just briefly summarize what I have distilled as the, the purposes of public diplomacy. The term public diplomacy was coined in the 60s, early 60s, uh, as a substitute for propaganda, which had ac acquired a rather negative connotation uh, during the course of the 20th century. <clears throat> and I'll say a little bit more about why it's different from propaganda, which I strongly feel it's different from propaganda. But one of the, f has three, main things that public diplomacy does. The first is it reports the news in a responsible, accurate, comprehensive, fair, and thorough way in parts of the world where the media are strongly censored or strongly biased or, or simply undeveloped. So it provides news, especially local and regional news, to parts of the world where there's only a state service or there's only a very propagandistic kind of local news. This is the history of Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty, Radio Free Asia, which began in the 90s, and uh, some other of our broadcast entities claim to be doing this. It's not clear to me they are. <coughs> um, and that's a, that's a very important, it's I think the, mo the politically most acceptable right now function of public diplomacy, because the, as you, I'm sure you know, uh, other governments in the world, notably Russia, and China and others and Iran and others are spending huge amounts of money on not only broadcasting within their own countries, but broadcasting in the region, in other languages, and around the world in a kind of CNN style, um, English language sort of headline news, Russia today being the most prominent example of it, 
Um, Russia Today now broadcasts in most of the world in uh, English, Spanish, Arabic, uh, and uh, one other language, which is escaping me at the moment. Oh, Mandarin. Mandarin. So, and we, of course, do nothing really very much like that right now. Number two, <clears throat> to present what Tr Harry Truman called a full and fair picture of American society, history, culture, and institutions. And here I would also emphasize political institutions and political traditions. Um, this is really not being done at all now. Um, and it's unfortunate. <clears throat> and I, you might wonder whether the government is capable of doing it. And I think that's a very valid question. All I can say is it's not going to be done by the commercial sector because there's really not much money in it. And the same goes for reporting the news in Uzbekistan or in uh, the mountain region between Pakistan and Afghanistan. You're not going to make a lot of money doing that. You're not going to make a lot of money broadcasting in a lot of places. So uh, who's going to do it? It's not going to be done by the commercial sector. And third is another one that's a bit problematic, which is to advocate for the United States, um, for its ideals, for its intentions in your part of the world, or the, you know, the world in general, and its interests. In other words, to explain foreign policy. <clears throat> of course, you have to have a foreign policy that can be explained. Um, <clears throat> but, you know, to have the responsibility of explaining it to the rest of the world and with the feedback that comes with that might actually be an added incentive to actually have a coherent foreign policy. Who knows? Well, the decline of public diplomacy was, uh, as I said, gradual, but um, it started actually before the end of the Cold War with the so-called culture wars and the counterculture of the 60s and the Vietnam War and the, and the divisions that arose in American society. A lot of people who had formerly been very helpful with the USIA and very willing to go on tours and, and give lectures and sort of be part of that effort, academics, journalists, artists, writers, went, went pretty far to the left for the most part, became alienated from doing propaganda for the government. And there's, a, there's a, many, many occasions I could describe to you of this happening. Meanwhile, uh, when President Reagan came in and made the wonderful and colorful uh, Charles Z. Wick, uh, head of USIA, there was a real push uh, to make US public diplomacy uh, a really finely honed Cold War weapon. And that mattered. I mean, I know some people who did that. It was really, it was good work, and they did it, they did it well for the most part. But that, in some ways, furthered the, the divisions. Uh, and it was seen as propaganda by some of its critics, and sometimes it was. Um, but um, then came the end of the Cold War. And so USIA was, a, you might say, an exhausted agency. It had, it had really done a lot. It, had, it was not in, under great leadership. And when Jesse Helms decided to cut a lot of US um, government agencies, including National Endowment for the Arts and all these other ones that were really in his sights, the only one that actually went down was the USIA. And that happened in 1999. But even before that, there had been serious cuts in all of these programs, including educational exchanges, cultural exchanges, things that were seen as not directly relevant to the ideological battle. And I would make the argument that those things are crucial, um, even though they don't necessarily move the needle of public opinion in foreign countries in a way that you can discern over a matter of weeks or months, but they build up uh, connections and relationships and channels of communication that are there in a crisis. Uh, similarly with the news, um, it's a slow buildup of trust. So the people have to know that they're going to get a reliable uh, sense of what's happening from the Voice of America or from Radio for Europe. You can't just drop in and say, hi, we're here with the truthful news, because everybody's doing that. So you have to build up trust over time. This is a, a long-term process. But as I say, um, it, it looked like a Cold, World, a Cold War relic in the 90s. And we needed a peace dividend, and so forth and so on. So it got cut, got cut rather drastically. 
um, at the same time in the 90s, huge changes in the world, huge changes in what would be the practice of this thing. Uh, very briefly, the first was in media. Even before the internet, you had the tape cassette. You had satellite TV, uh, a medium which, whose importance is often overlooked in this discussion, but it was satellite TV that penetrated the entire Middle East, that penetrated huge swaths of the world who had never seen anything but their local state TV. Um, and a great bulk of it was entertainment, but I'll get to that in a minute. <clears throat> and then, of course, came the internet and our beloved social media. New players. Uh, the rise of NGOs in the 90s was astronomical. Uh, businesses became more and more uh, involved overseas. Churches uh, expanded missionary efforts and short-term, more short-term kinds of involvement overseas. Universities, needless to say, have expanded. So there's a, just to sum it up, there's a lot of non-governmental players uh, who are involved. And some people say, well, that is our public diplomacy. This is America. We don't want the government doing it. We want all these uh, private sector uh, institutions and organizations doing it. And I think that's a very cogent argument. I actually went along with that for a while. But when you look at it from the point of view of other countries, there's an expectation that the US government is going to speak and that the US government will have a voice and it will have a voice and it will talk to you uh, in Oman or in some other country. That the US government has something to say and invites you to listen. And if that vo government voice isn't there, I've, I traveled to 11 countries researching my book and I must have talked to over 300 individuals overseas from all different walks of life. And the, the most consistent complaint was really that Americans don't pay attention. They don't talk to us, they don't listen to us, they don't care about us. And in a world that's supposed to be anti-American, that's a rather striking uh, sentiment, but I've heard it reflected by many others. And then, of course, we have new adversaries, non-state actors. You know, Islamic State, I would argue, is neither Islamic nor a state. Um, it's certainly not a country. Um, and uh, you may call it totalitarian, but it's not totalitarian in any 20th century sense because it's a, it's a bunch of uh, roving gangsters uh, who are turning upon each other as much as upon their presumed enemies. Uh, the Middle East is in a state of uh, violent and chaotic religious wars. Um, so there's a lot of, lots of non-state actors there who can get their hands on weapons, as was pointed out earlier this morning. Then you have the new authoritarian regimes. You have China, and you have Russia, and Iran, and some others. <clears throat> and uh, they're different from the Cold War because they deliver, at least China does, and Russia kind of did, they deliver prosperity to at least a, a very significant part of their population. And, you know, as you know, the Cold War was as much about prosperity, America's prosperity, as it was about our freedom and our way of government. Um, it was about all the goodies that we had and the, our comfortable way of life. Well, it's not about that so much anymore. It's about something else. Because the Chinese model, as it's so called, the Beijing model, I know it's gotten a little rocky lately, was uh, that you could have an authoritarian government and deliver prosperity, and you can just administer the population and control the population, and you don't need any of these messy and, and uh, uh, annoying democratic institutions. So give them bread and circuses and deny them basic political liberties. <clears throat> Speaking of circuses, the other thing that happened in the 90s was the explosive spread of American popular culture, American entertainment, commercial entertainment throughout the world. As these new technologies arose, notably satellite television, um, they had to fill their hours. So what did they do? They bought the worst American soap operas, the bold and the beautiful. Um, all sorts of, you know, American programs, some good, don't get me wrong, I spent most of my adult life writing about popular culture, I don't think it's all terrible by any means, or I wouldn't have done that. Um, but it has changed in many ways for the worse, and I think it's on a downward trajectory right now. 
And the worst thing, the worst stuff um, got out there in all sorts of places to all sorts of people um, in a completely uncontrolled way. It's even impossible to measure the full impact and the full spread. Because even if you look at the numbers, which I'll give you in a minute, they only cover the legal export. And usually just the legal export to uh, the more lucrative markets. And that ain't the whole world. And it doesn't cover the piracy, the illegal DVDs, the cop, the legal knockoff DVDs, which is a huge industry. Um, not to mention the internet and all the illegal downloading that goes on. So it's impossible to measure the spread of this. So I'm, I've, I've arrived at my second topic, which is um, the impact of our popular culture, our entertainment, on the perceptions of the United States and of Americans, who we are as human beings. Now, one reason why this was allowed to happen was because of the history of the Cold War. During the Cold War, American popular culture was one of America's secret weapons. In fact, uh, several uh, Russians uh, said after the opening of the, so after the collapse of the Soviet Union, um, many, many Russians testified to having listened to jazz on the voice of America, or having later, a little later on a younger generation listening to some rock music, uh, selected rock music and soul music on the voice of America. And the power of that music, either conveyed by the governmental channel or just informally as it just sifted into those countries, was smuggled in and so forth, was astounding. Um, as I'm sure a lot of you know, the, the so-called Velvet Revolution in Czechoslovakia, uh, one of the heroic figures or the heroic um, figures from that period were a little rock band called the Plastic People of the Universe. Now, this is not a rock band you want to sit down and kick back your heels and listen to their music. They were more like an absurdist performance art, which is really not my thing. <clears throat> um, but the thing about the plastic people of the universe in Prague was that they wouldn't stop doing what they were doing. And the communist authorities cracked down on them every conceivable way. And they wouldn't stop doing what they were doing. They just kept doing what they were doing. And after a while, they attracted the attention of Václav Havel and of his associates who were more serious political um, act actors. And they became a kind of cult hero. And to, the, to this day, if you talk about that little band in Prague, you will get a response from people. So that was true. <clears throat> so we had an uncritical attitude toward our popular culture at the end of the Cold War. It was, it was something that had really made a difference in parts of the world, and a, good one, a difference for the good. Even our countercultural rock music of the 60s, which was uh, regarded um, with loathing at home by many people, uh, was understood to be subversive in these foreign settings. So you may not like it here, but over there it was pretty subversive, so it had to be good. So we didn't, we didn't feel real critical about this. And so it was kind of a laissez-faire, just let it all go out there. It's, it'll bring messages of freedom, it'll bring messages of democracy. So I won't say that it hasn't done that, but I will say that it's carried a lot of other messages with it along as well. Um, in particular, that Americans have uh, a taste for the ex extreme vulgarity, that Americans relish extreme and hideous graphic violence, that we find this very amusing and we love to, to watch it and that we are very vitriolic people, um, quite uh, hateful and spiteful and cynical in our political discourse and indeed in all of our discourse. This is all true, of course. Uh, but I use the metaphor of a funhouse mirror uh, or maybe to update it, a bad selfie. <clears throat> um, there's truth to it, but it's grossly exaggerated. You know, it's, it's, it's blown out of proportion. And the good parts of America, the part that offsets that, the part that after we're through watching the violent movie, we go out and walk down the street and we don't really think we're gonna get shot at. Um, all that part, the normal part, the part that's us, airbrushed out. Our religiosity airbrushed out. Our civil society, our institutions, our voluntary organizations, 
Hillsdale College, its supporters, people like you and me, airbrushed out. And not just conservative people, but you know, decent, hardworking Americans who try to hold their families together, who have certain you know, <coughs> basic values airbrushed out. Now again, not entirely, not always. I could give you a list of uh, things that if I were a culture, I won't say czar because I think that would not, not go over well. Um, but if I were in charge of cultural export, I might consider, uh, I have a list of things I'd like to broadcast, but I'm not sure that's the way to go. Okay, well, I won't, you know, this, this, this export of popular culture expanded very, very drastically. Um, the total export sales figure for the U.S. entertainment in 2012 was $35.6 billion. And that was an increase about fourfold from the 1980s. And that's the legal distribution of American popular culture. Um, now, what is the evidence? What evidence do I have for making these claims, uh, apart from all the people I talked to? Well, the people I talked to have influenced me, I will grant. Um, they've influenced me a lot. Um, but there's also a little bit of other kinds of evidence. Um, the Pew World Attitudes Survey, which is a huge sample of people, over 45,000 people in 47 countries. No, it's more than that. It's 300 and something thousand people in 47 countries. Um, sh they do show that a majority of people in the world, at least the people they poll, say they like American movies, music, and TV. You, you can't deny that, and you wouldn't be making all that money overseas if people didn't like this stuff. But, of course, this is disliked in the entire Muslim-majority world, which won't surprise anyone. It's disliked in Russia, and it's disliked in India, where people are very pro-American. Uh, I could talk about that a little bit. But here's a more interesting, I think a more interesting finding from Pew. They find um, majorities in, in a great many countries agreeing with the statement, quote, it's bad that American ideas and customs are spreading here, unquote. And this is in friendly countries, European countries, lots of places. So I just ask, Pew doesn't ask this, but I do. Where do these people get their impression of American ideas and customs? Well, the answer is from our popular culture. Now, I start my book with an interview I did with a, not a terrorist, but a very disruptive and unpleasant Islamist uh, in Jakarta, in Indonesia, who goes around breaking, with baseball bats, breaking the windows in movie theaters and things like that. They don't set off bombs, but uh, they do very disruptive things. And he spent some time in Saudi Arabia and brought back a Wahhabist uh, view of Islam that is, does not sit well in Indonesia, where they have their own version of Islam, and they're a very multicultural society, and they don't really cotton to this uh, version of it. By the way, there are more Muslims in Indonesia than there are in all the Arab countries combined. Um, <clears throat> but this guy is pretty well known in Indonesia. And I start my book with an interview with him, and he says what you'd expect. American culture is out to, America is out to destroy Islam, and our culture is our weapon, is one of our weapons. Uh, he believed firmly as do many ordinary people, because their own media have always been owned by the state, they think that this stuff is coming from the U.S. government. Why wouldn't they? They don't understand that this is an independent, privately owned industry in the United States. It's not true in their country. It's not true in most countries. So they think the government is sent, U.S. government is sending them sex in the city. And. Uh, a long list of other things, uh, worse things. But, you know, you can respond to that guy by saying, well, nothing's going to change his mind, and I think that's true. Um, and besides, um, it's the price we pay for freedom. It's the price we pay for liberty. So just get over it. And I think that's the dominant attitude today in America, across the political spectrum. But. After I talked to him, I talked to a woman who works in television in Jakarta, 
she was a lovely lady. Uh, she was no radical. She was a religious lady, but she didn't cover her hair. She was kind of very middle class, spoke very good English. Um, just a regular person like you and me. Uh, very smart, um, very stylish. And she said she was really concerned about how Indonesian television programs were imitating American programs and they were having a bad effect on her kids. It, it could have been an American mother talking. You know, it, it was no different. She talked about some show that was on during dinner time and it showed a woman being strangled to death on the screen. And she said, I don't want my kids watching some woman getting strangled to death on the screen when they're having dinner. Um, and I've heard, you know, throughout my career, I've heard plenty of Americans express the same sentiment. So I began my book that way because I'm trying to show that I'm not worried about what uh, violent extremist, radicalist, jihadist Muslims think about our culture. I mean, they would condemn Shakespeare as well. I'm worried about what people like Rosimi Sahalahi thinks, the lady that I talked to, um, because she's not, you know, there's more people like her in the world than there are like uh, Rizik Muhammad, the first man. Unlike Americans, when these people see our program, some of our worst material that we export, they can't adjust the picture. They can't say, well, that's breaking bad, you know. <laughs> Uh, not everybody in Albuquerque is into meth, you know. Not every chemistry teacher uh, is cooking meth, you know. Um, you know, not every every uh, family in America is, you know, hoarding guns and, and dead bodies and, you know, all this horrific stuff that goes on in these programs. Uh, some of them very well-made programs, I must admit, and entertaining. So we can be entertained by them. We can laugh at it. We can get, a, you know, be offended by it. We can be... Uh, perhaps even think that it's a serious show, that it's trying to make us think about something. But we go about our daily life, we know that's not really an accurate portrait of our society. But there are billions of people in the world who cannot do that. They have no way of adjusting the picture. Now, even worse, I think, now let me shift away a little bit, even more concerning to me as I've thought about this over time than the vulgarity and the violence and the vitriol is the portrait of American life and institutions particularly our political institutions, um, our, our, our business institutions, our private sector, our daily life, our communities. Um, that to me is in some ways more disturbing because that really speaks, um, I think maybe you can assume the other stuff is kind of a pandering to the lowest common denominator and many people in other countries are smart enough to figure that out. But the portrait of our institutions really bothers me <clears throat> because it fits all too well with the propaganda of our enemies. If you hired a PR firm to portray American society and institutions and culture in a way that would feed directly into Vladimir Putin's anti-American propaganda machine, you could not do better than most of what Hollywood is doing these days. And there's just no getting around that. It ha in Germany, I was in Germany in October giving a series of lectures. And I met some young people, Germans, who were really into this series I mentioned a minute ago, Breaking Bad. I suspect there probably aren't too many Breaking Bad fans in here. Um, maybe there are, who knows. Um, you can read my review of it in the Claremont Review of Books. Um, but this young man, he was, a, you know, he was a thoughtful young man. He was working for one of the political foundations in Berlin. I asked him, uh, gee, Oh, you like Breaking Bad? What do you, what do you and your friends uh, get out of that show? And he said, well, it's a portrait of, of uh, how Americans will do anything for money. Uh, it's a portrait of, uh, uh, you know, the, the sort of the desperate, uh, you know, desperate straits of Americans and the, the lawlessness of America and uh, uh, the drug problems in America. And I said, well, we have all, we have, those kinds of things in America, but um, you know, I, you can imagine, I argued with him the way I'm talking to you, and he, he sort of took it in. I don't know if I made a dent in him, but um, another example, House of Cards. How many of you have watched the American version of House of Cards? Ah, see, see, okay, quite a few. Uh, I think it's pretty bad. 
You can also read my review of that in the Claremont Review of Books. Um, it's a slick production. If you ever spend any time in Washington, you will not recognize what it makes, tries to make Washington look like. Um, worst of all, it isn't about what's wrong in Washington. <laughs> it's about sort of a Macbeth story, a conspiracy, you know, which worked really well in the British version, by the way. I recommend the British version because it was about a struggle within the conservative party for power. And uh, it, it kind of, the Macbeth thing kind of worked. But in the American version, the guy who made it had spent, I think, one internship in Washington, as opposed to the guy who did the British version, who had spent 40 years working in the Thatcher government, or f working for Margaret Thatcher and in the Conservative Party. So one knew a lot about what he was dealing with, the other knew practically nothing, and it shows. But despite all this, the show was very popular online in China, on the Sohu uh, streaming website. Now, when I say very popular, it had a few, a few hundred million viewers, which is pittance in China. But among those viewers included several high officials in the Chinese Communist Party, who went around praising the show and recommending it to their friends. Now, is this good news or bad? The old Cold War thing is, well, you know, Chinese officials are watching an American TV show. That must be liberating, right? Well, I'm currently sponsoring a Chinese Fulbright scholar at Boston College, a man from Beijing who's a kind of a, teaches American studies and film at the Chinese Foreign Studies University in Beijing. He argues sometimes that every American cultural export, no matter how, how awful, is a double-edged sword, including House of Cards. Because no matter how negative the picture, what really comes across is American freedom of expression. And because he's friends with a lot of the so-called sixth generation film producers, film directors in China, who are now getting shut, systematically shut down um, by President Xi and his, administ his um, administration, his, the party, um, he knows what's happening in China and he's continually impressed that you can make such anti-government such anti-American films in Hollywood and get away with it. And that's the sort of gut feeling that I think a lot of people in authoritarian uh, societies have to these shows. But, but, um, there was a villain in the, in the second season of House of Cards. I hope none of you made it to the second season. It was even worse than the first. Um, it was a Chinese villain. This raised great concern in the Central Department of Propaganda and Thought Work. I'm not inventing that name. Um, and there were high level meetings and a writer at the English language daily, China Daily, and also at People's Daily, the, the Chinese language uh, national party newspaper, was commissioned to write an article explaining that House of Cards, yes, they had a Chinese villain, but don't worry, the show, and I quote, is actually a strong diatribe against the political system in the United States. So everybody felt better. Um, I guess I've gone on over my time. I was going to make a th some points at the end, but I look at my clock with horror. Um, wait, it's 1.20? My watch has picked a funny time to stop, so I'm glad there's another clock up here. I'll keep going. Um, Six weeks ago, I took my Chinese visitor to see The Interview, a show that was in the headlines recently, a potty-mouthed, blood-spattered comedy about two hapless American journalists recruited by the CIA to assassinate the leader of North Korea, Kim Jong-un, the dictator of North Korea, I should say. Now, as you may remember, The Interview was scheduled to open on Christmas Day. But its release was canceled and then limited by Sony Pictures uh, because of a recent cyber attack on Sony Pictures and because of a vague terrorist threat that was said to emanate from North Korea. So, based on the media coverage of these events, not to mention President Obama's denunciation of Sony for caving into terrorists, my Chinese Fulbright scholar was expecting a bold and sophisticated satire. The kind of movie you can't make in China. Well, what he got was um, one part satire, and not very good satire, to uh, ten parts 
rectum jokes, boner jokes, vomit jokes, diarrhea jokes, death by poison jokes, death by automatic weapons jokes, severed fingers spurting blood jokes, tank and helicopter battle jokes, and finally the biggest joke, uh, Kim's face starting to melt before his body is engulfed in flame. And that's not even mentioning the profanity, which seemed to genuinely ch shock my Chinese visitor. I mean, I was really amazed. He couldn't get over the profanity. Um, and on the way home, I reminded him of a comment that he'd made when I first spoke with him in Beijing, um, which I quoted in my book. He said, quote, I don't like censorship, but it does sanitize the image of America in China, end quote. Well, I don't like censorship either. And I do not advocate government control either of the entertainment industry or of its exports. But as I will explain in a minute, I see nothing wrong with urging Hollywood to be more mindful of the impact some of its products are having on foreign perceptions of America. So part three, what is required for a solution? Um, I'm gonna set forth two things. Uh, which I think will have to be borne in mind in any effort to improve America's reputation in the world. And they're both based in time-honored traditions uh, that are unique to America and instrumental in her, in her greatness in the world. Now the first is that public diplomacy conducted by the government, and public diplomacy, I don't think I said this before, simply means the U.S. government addressing the public in foreign, in foreign countries, not the leaders, not the diplomats, not elites necessarily, although elites are included, but also the, the broader population. That's why it's called public diplomacy. Um, that it be based on the truth, even if that means fighting an asymmetrical war with our adversaries. The second requirement is that Americans in general, and Hollywood in particular, remember that there's a difference between coercive state censorship and freely chosen voluntary restraints on speech by individuals, organizations, and societies. First, I'll say quickly about the public diplomacy part. Now, the propagandists of Russia, China, Iran, and ISIS, IS, um, and Al-Qaeda and all those other groups <clears throat> pursue a two-pronged strategy. First, they go in for what uh, Joseph Goebbels called the big lie, a false historical narrative that in all of these cases portrays the United States as the leader of an evil Western conspiracy to, uh, conspiracy to subjugate the rest of the world. Now, when they're faced with evidence that contradicts their big lie or they suspect somebody might not be buying their big lie, they go in, particularly Russia's particularly good at this, they go in for the big confusion, um, flooding every available media space with bizarre rumors, conspiracy theories, paranoid fantasies, in the hope that their audiences um, will simply give up on caring about what really happened and decide there's real, become just cynical and decide there's no, there's no real uh, truth to the matter. It's just everything's an opinion, everything's propaganda, so it's all BS, you know, and just become very jaded and cynical. And that's very, very true of um, Russians and Russian speakers in Russia's neighbors, neighboring countries. And the Putin regime is very skilled at dealing with these kind of very jaded, cynical populations. Um, it's also trying to build up a historical narrative of the glory and, and wonder of Russia and so forth and re rebuild a kind of idealism. Good luck with that. Um, so how do we respond to this? It's different from the Soviet Union's communist ideology, which of course itself lost its credence uh, long before the end of the Cold War. How do you deal with people who are so confused and cynical that they don't think there's any such thing as an objective truth or a fact about, even a, even a basic fact about the Malaysian airline that came down? You know, just, nobody knows. Who's gonna know? Ah, it's all lies. Um, do we fight fire with fire and bombard these populations uh, with counter-propaganda? 
This is very tempting to a lot of people, especially if they haven't been thinking about it a whole lot. Um, or should we do what comes naturally to a society where liberty is sacrosanct? Where liberty is sacrosanct. Gather the facts, articulate the principles at stake, and disseminate them both as forcefully as possible, even if some aspects of the story do not reflect well on the United States. Now, there was a time when America got involved in blatant propaganda, which is to say, big lies. And this was uh, before America's entry into World War I. Um, perhaps some of you uh, know that the British were very anxious to get America involved in the war. And uh, the British government um, disseminated a great deal of hate propaganda against the Germans, in particular. Um, they fabricated stories of atrocities committed by the Germans in Belgium and elsewhere. They were fabrications, and they were widely disseminated. Even the fledgling movie industry in the United States got into the act, um, making films with titles like The Hun and The Kaiser, The Beast of Berlin. I actually saw part of that once. It's not a very good movie. Um, but after World War I, by the 1930s, by the 1930s, both the British and the American governments uh, realized how much damage this had done. Uh, in the first place, it inspired Joseph Goebbels and Adolf Hitler. The big lie, you know, um, hate, hate propaganda could be done through modern media. And some of their inspiration came from what the British had done before World War I. Other, of course, came from what the Soviets were doing. But what the British and Americans did in this one instance was uncomfortably similar to what the Soviets and the Nazis had done. And the other damage, really bad damage, was that when the first stories began to circulate in Europe about Nazi atrocities in the 30s, people didn't believe them because they thought they had been fabricated. Um, there's a wonderful historian uh, in Britain who's written a lot about this, um, my main source. Um, <clears throat> this is why during World War II and the Cold War, Britain, America, Britain and America took the relatively high road um, there was uh, no lack of spying and lying in both of those conflicts. Um, but when it came to communicating with large foreign populations, both Britain and America refrained from spreading blatant lies and disinformation. And this is when the word propaganda lost its, uh, lost its neutrality and became a bad word. Compared with the propaganda of the Third Reich and the propaganda of the Soviet Communist Party, this approach was decidedly asymmetrical. But you know what? It worked. OK, last piece, popular culture. Requirements for a solution for our popular culture. Well, I don't, the last chapter of my book is full of practical recommendations. Um, and they're still fresh. Nobody's taken me up on them. So. Um, although they actually are being read by a few uh, people in Washington. Um, let me, this, for this last piece, I want to say something about censorship, uh, going back to what I said earlier. Um, this is the last thing I'll say. Um, of course, just as the story about the interview and Sony was fading from the headlines at New Year's, we had the attacks on the satirical weekly Charlie Hebdo in Paris by uh, uh, self-taught, homegrown terrorists. Uh, and, of course, on the kosher super supermarket and other, other targets. The attack on Charlie Hebdo, uh, in particular, inspired a great outcry supporting an absolute principle of free speech, um, according to which all forms of expression, including obscenity, slander, blasphemy, are acceptable. And all limits on expression, from coercive censorship to voluntary restraint by individuals and society are unacceptable. Now the logic here is that of the slippery slope. Every limit on speech is defined as perforce a fatal step on the road to tyranny and uh, the destruction of freedom. Therefore, no limits on speech should ever be placed. Now lost in the outcry 
was the fact that this absolute principle has never been upheld by any society, including modern democratic societies. Indeed, in every society known to humanity, there have been limits of some kind on speech. The question, the real question is why, in spite of this fact, some societies remain much freer than others. Now, here's another thing that was lost in that outcry, and this is the distinction I'm highlighting for you, which is the distinction between coercive censorship, particular state censorship, uh, legal censorship, and voluntary restraint. Now, of course, some forms of state censorship and coercion are softer than others. Uh, in China, for example, uh, and Russia, you can just make one professor disappear, and the other professors will get the hint. Uh, my friend, my Fulbright friend, one of his colleagues at Foreign Studies University was recently demoted to stacking books in the library. He was taken, his stuff removed from his office, he's gone. I mean, he's not in prison. As long as he behaves himself, he won't be in prison. But he's in the basement of the building stacking books in the library. This was somebody who was teaching classes and talking about Tiananmen Square and American culture and film. And he's gone. Um, and I don't know how my friend will react, frankly. Um, this is what people f mean usually when they talk about self-censorship. They mean that a powerful police state or some other overweening authority has intimidated you into silence. This is not the same thing as voluntary restraint in a liberal democracy. Here's the difference. Voluntary restraint is, well, voluntary. <laughs> um, when exercised by an individual, we call it tact, discretion, prudence, reticence. When exercised by a society, we call it custom, propriety, social norms, public morality. Now, I think you will agree with me, these days it's easier to defend individual restraint on speech than it is to defend social restraints. Um, and this is because social restraints have been roundly condemned by such champions of free speech as John Stuart Mill, for example. Uh, indeed, a big part of Mill's argument in his famous book on liberty is against, quote, the hostile and dreaded censorship, unquote, of ingrained social attitudes. From this and many other sources, we in the West have inherited the idea that freedom depends on letting creative individuals push the envelope of accepted social norms. Now, Mill's sharpest critic, James Fitzjames Stephen, took issue with this uh, view, and his reply to Mill was simple and commonsensical. It was actually quite long and complex, but he did say some simple and commonsensical things, one of which was, the custom of looking upon certain courses of conduct with aversion is the essence of morality. Here's the problem as I see it for us. Mill's assumption is now playing out on a global, a global stage where the decisive battle over free speech is not being fought between the creative individual and social conformity. It's being fought between those who would defend the fundamental liberties of the West and those who would destroy them. And to wage that battle, we in the West must, must do more than cheer for every gross out comedy and in your face publication that comes along. We must think seriously about the limits that we do place on speech and expression, why we place those limits, and most important, how we place those limits. Now here I think America has a valuable lesson to teach Europe. Um, here in America, if I, may, well, if I may paraphrase real, Will Rogers, we are all self-censors, only on different topics. Consider, the vast, the vast majority of Americans now disapprove of derogatory racial and ethnic epithets. The question is, how did this come about? For most Americans, this particular restraint on speech reflects a strong social consensus that developed slowly over time. So we don't consider it self-censorship most of the time except sometimes. 
And those times are when we feel intimidated or coerced by someone in authority not to speak freely. In other words, when we feel silenced by some imposed rule or law. It takes a long time for a given restraint on speech to sort of take hold, to become accepted. Uh, not just by a particular group, an elite, but by everybody. And because that process is so slow, people are tempted to speed it up by passing a law or a con other coercive measure. We see this pattern in our American universities, where 40 years ago, roughly, an informal campaign began to purge academic discourse of racial bias, gender bias, disability bi virus, no, virus, bias, and every other conceivable form of bias, which are, have you, as you may know, have taken truly elaborate forms these days. Now, this campaign began informally, but it went much too slowly for some of its more ardent proponents. It also suffered a setback when critics stuck it with the old Stalinist label of political correctness. I can still remember um, Irving Kristol's wife, Gertrude Himmelfarb, in 1991, the joy with which she discovered that phrase, political correctness, because it captured so much of what she was trying to criticize about what was going on in academia. And believe me, that, that, that was a setback for the politically correct. The reaction was predictable and completely counterproductive. And that would be, of course, the university speech codes uh, that we now have uh, that have been imposed on institutions whose entire raison d'etre is uh, free inquiry. Now, on a larger scale, you can see the same pattern in Europe, where many countries have so-called hate speech laws on the books. For example, in France, <clears throat> where the civil law tradition is more proscriptive than the Anglo-American common law tradition, uh, and France also has no First Amendment, as you know, in 1990, the French National Assembly passed uh, the Gayson Act, uh, which is one of several Holocaust denial laws on the books in Europe and, of course, also in Israel. A few years later, France's fundamental press law, which was passed in 1881, uh, was amended to prohibit spa hate speech based on race, religion, gender, and sexual orientation. Sounds kind of like an American university, doesn't it? This has led to many prosecutions of individuals and publications whose stock in trade is outrageous speech. Now, one such is uh, Dieudonné, a child of the banlieue outside Paris, uh, who went from being a popular comedian working with a Jewish boyhood friend uh, to being France's most notorious anti-Semite and Holocaust denier. Another target of these laws has been the satirical weekly Charlie Hebdo which never tires of attacking religion. Just to cite one example, in 2011, it ran a cover showing three rolls of toilet paper, one labeled Torah, one labeled Bible, and one labeled Quran, under the caption, in the toilet, all the religions. Another cover shows a rabbi and an SS officer sharing a sloppy kiss outside the gates of Auschwitz. And these are mild compared to what you find inside Charlie Hebdo. <laughs> um, for example, uh, one image that was sent to me by a friend in, in, uh, in Germany, actually, whose brother collects Charlie Hebdo's, um, was an image of uh, Christ committing an act of sodomy with God. So clearly, Charlie Hebdo is an equal opportunity offender. However, during the last decade, it has lavished particular venom on Islam. In 2013, it ran a two-part series called The Life of Muhammad, in which Muhammad is depicted as a fat, ugly lecher with a bad case of priapism uh, displayed in graphic X-rated detail. Now, some of the lawsuits brought against Diodoné and Charlie Hebdo have won. Others have lost. Um, forcing the offenders to pay steep fines and lawyers' fees. Um, all have been decided on fine points of law which make little sense to the public. For example, 
France has a law against hate speech. Now, you have to, I know it's after lunch, but stay with me on this, okay? This is a fine point of the law. France has a law against hate speech based on religion, but no law against blasphemy. Now, this means you can trash a fellow citizen whose beliefs you abhor, but you cannot, no, wait, you cannot trash a, a fellow citizen whose beliefs you abhor, but you can trash his beliefs. Now, I don't know about you, I'm not a lawyer, but that looks to me a lot like a hair waiting to be split. And that is the, precisely the problem. When lawyers and judges and courts regulate speech, the line between sophistication and sophistry becomes blurred. Uh, and the result is, to judge by what's going on in Europe right now, is ever uglier and more provocative violations of the law. So I would close uh, very briefly by contrasting that with the policy of US newspapers in the wake of the Danish cartoons and also the Charlie Hebdo, not to reprint some of these images, for which they were excoriated. Now, there's, an, there's actually a blasphemy law on the books in Massachusetts from 1697. If, you try, if the Boston Globe ran one of these cartoons and they got prosecuted under that law, the case would get thrown out of court, First Amendment grounds, uh, subsequent court cases, there's no way you could make that stick. Uh, but that's not why the Globe and other newspapers in the United States didn't publish those cartoons. They didn't publish them because they have a tradition of not publishing material that is grossly offensive to people's religious sensibilities. Voluntary restraint. It's a long-standing custom for which they have been excoriated for not sh defending free speech by uh, publishing some of these cartoons. Um, I will just close by saying this because I'm getting a few signals from some of my supporters here. <coughs> um, <coughs> something like this, I think. <laughs> um, <coughs> The world's most robust tradition of free speech and expression does not consist of a blanket refusal to set any limits. Rather, it consists of a preference for voluntary restraint, both individual and communal, over coercive censorship, especially by the state. Much as Americans love liberty, we must not let that love blind us to the importance of occasionally holding our tongue. Thank you. <clears throat> So